On behalf of the Marines Memorial Association and the World Affairs Council of Northern California, I'm Mike Myatt, your moderator for this evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. Linda Robinson is a senior international policy analyst at the RAND Corporation. Linda's areas of expertise include national security strategy, U.S. foreign policy, special operation forces, irregular warfare, and stability operations. She's worked in, shall I say, very interesting locations in our world. In fact, I was talking to a, a Lieutenant Colonel Air Force that just returned from a year in Afghanistan. He says, Linda Robinson came to see us five times while I was there in Afghanistan. Her current research centers on defense strategy, post-conflict transitions, and special operations forces. She's authored numerous articles and has recently authored a book titled 100 Victories, Special Operations, and the Future of American Warfare. And I know you'll have questions, and there are question cards on your chairs. Fill those out and raise your hand, and our staff will pick them up and bring to me, and I'll moderate the, the Q&A portion. But ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Linda Robinson. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to this. I came to the World Affairs Council here when I published my book, Masters of Chaos, and it was a great conversation. So I look forward to another one tonight. I would like to um, really handle this as a conversation. I'm going to tell you some stories, tell you a little bit about how I did the book, um, and, and try to... Um, set the stage for what I hope will be not an acrimonious debate, but really a reflection on where we are as a country and where the military is. Um, I'd like to start just by a show of hands. I'm curious how many people have been in the military or uh, have family members in the military. And of that, how many have been in Afghanistan? Thank you. Um, I was at the Naval Postgraduate School a few days ago down in Monterey, and I asked the question about service in Afghanistan, and everyone in the auditorium raised their hand, virtually everyone. So it was really quite remarkable. And you know, to me, it's very important to um, try to bridge the gap as a writer between those who've had these experiences and those for whom it's really something very remote and foreign. So what I did, and I, I have had a long career of going out and covering uh, foreign wars, small wars generally, insurgencies in Latin America since 9-11, a lot of time in Afghanistan, in Iraq. And I began um, in 2009 after I published my book on Iraq. I came back to focus on Afghanistan and trying to figure out what was going on there. And what caught my eye among the many uh, complexities of that war was this initiative that had been launched that had various names. It was called Community Defense Initiative, Local Defense Initiative, and then the name that stuck was, it's a long one, Village Stability Operations and Afghan Local Police. And I'll explain the, the two-part name there. But it turned into really the biggest and longest endeavor by special operations forces since Vietnam. And I felt really compelled to get out into the field and cover it, write about it, and try to produce a chronicle of the initiative, what it entailed, um, how it turned out, and what we might learn from it for the future. Uh, it's, it's also a much less t told story than the bin Laden raid. So I really felt it was important to balance uh, some of the stories that have received so much attention with a, an initiative that has tremendous, I, I think um, the scope of it is tremendous and the potential implications uh, are also tremendous. From giving a number of these talks, I found that it makes sense to start out with a very quick snapshot of who special operations forces are. Uh, because again, I don't think there's very um, good knowledge in the general public. They have grown tremendously since 9-11, doubled in size. There are now 33,000 special operators, and this is uniformed special operators. 
You may read in the um, some news accounts they will cite 66,000. That's personnel assigned to Special Operations Command, the four-star command, and it includes civilian personnel and conventional military. So the actual uh, badged special operators, 33,000. And their op tempo has also grown enormously. It's almost tripled in the last decade, so in terms of the number of deployments as well as the length. Uh, of their uh, missions. Uh, they have a very wide range of capabilities. I won't go into great detail on that now, but it is important to note that they come from all services. Um, the, of the 33,000, fully half of them are from the Army, and that includes the largest subset is the Army Green Berets. Uh, but it also includes uh, psychological operations, uh, civil affairs, Army aviators, and they are the ones that fly the helicopters, uh, and the rangers. And of course, rangers are very famous, but they're a very small component. 3,400 um, is the size of the ranger regiment. Um, the famous Navy SEALs, uh, also very small. They have the um, special warfare combat crewmen that make up part of naval special warfare. So in total, the Navy component is about 9,000. And then the newest component in Special Operations Command is MARSOC, the Marine Special Operations Command, uh, which has uh, taken on a wide array of missions uh, since it became part of Special Ops Command in 2006. We can talk more about the different subsets and what they do, uh, but overall their uh, level of, not just their size, their level of sophistication has really increased greatly, in part because they have now had a rank structure grow up. They have 70 flag and general officers now before there was just a handful, you could count the number of generals or admirals on uh, two hands. So they've really grown up now um, as a community with leadership. That leadership is thinking very uh, deeply about what what is our impact beyond the tactical operator level and what do we need to do to be uh, contributing at the operational and strategic level of war. So I spent two years coming and going from Afghanistan. I negotiated my access to the ground level units, which wasn't easy because for this initiative, the civil defense initiative, these small teams, uh, 12 to 16 man teams, were uh, spread out across Afghanistan in the tiniest villages and they would go and live in these mud walled compounds called Kalats. So what I was proposing to go out and document this initiative, what, posed a lot of uh, logistic and uh, security uh, and safety concerns. Um, but I've, I've learned one thing in my writing career, that you don't get what you want if you aren't persistent. And there was really no way that I could chronicle this from afar. Uh, this was a story happening out in the remotest parts of Afghanistan. Um, I did have to pick where I wanted to go. And looking at the map of Afghanistan and looking at the plan for the growth of this civil defense initiative, I decided I needed to go to the same place multiple times so I could chronicle the changes that occurred uh, as these uh, special ops teams uh, worked in the villages. And the basic principle of their presence there was to connect with the tribal elders, discuss with them uh, what they felt was driving the conflict in their area, and whether they wanted to have a village defense program. It was entirely the decision of the elders whether or not they wanted to do this. So this was not a program imposed upon the Afghans. And in some cases, after a number of months, the uh, special ops teams would pull out having decided there really wasn't the interest. Um, and in some cases, the Taliban uh, intimidation just proved too severe. There was a, um, a, a very hard winter that a SEAL team went through in Zabul province, tried like the Dickens, and there was some interest by the villagers, but it was just too hard. Uh, and they were reluctant to call it quits, but their senior leadership said, now it's time to get out, we need to use you somewhere else. So that was the basic uh, format of this. It was a volunteer uh, defense program, much along the lines of the civilian regular defense um, initiative in Vietnam. 
and the Marines had a similar program that they ran in Vietnam. So it was really based on the interest, the self-preservation interest of the Afghan people in the rural areas where the insurgency was strongest. So I picked four provinces, Kunar, Paktika, Kandahar, and Uruzgan, and I made repeat visits to select districts over the two-year period. And I, I wanted to sort of hone in on one, one locale to tell you a story um, about it, but I'm happy to talk about any of these places, particularly those of you who've been in Afghanistan. Uh, you may want to ask about some particular um, observations I had since I did spend a lot of time in those areas. And I made some other random visits um, to try to broaden out my, um, my scope of understanding. I also did interview the higher echelons on each trip. Uh, so I worked my way down from the command in Kabul uh, to um, the um, divisions. They were called, um, their lower command, the battalion command level was called a SODAF. Uh, and they uh, were, were the uh, lieutenant colonel level. And then down below that was the company level, and then below that is the team level. So I would work my way down because I wanted to understand what the perception was of how they were doing at each level. But where I really spent my time was out with those uh, 12 to 16 man teams. I want to talk to you a little bit about Kunar. And the reason I chose today that this was the place I was going to tell a story about is because I read in the New York Times, you know, the Prime Minister of Pakistan uh, was is visiting the country and met with uh, President Obama. And they're trying to find a way to repair a relationship that really did come unraveled um, definitively in, in 2011, but really as a, a consequence of a series of disagreements. There are some fundamental disagreements between the two countries, um, but also, as I'm sure all of you are aware, being very well-informed citizens, um, the U.S. Uh, launched a very heavy um, barrage of drone strikes in the region called the Fatah, where the Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, insurgents uh, were rooted. And that, coupled with uh, a few other incidents, such as the a CIA contractor who shot a couple of Pakistanis, uh, and then a, uh, the bin Laden raid, of course, which the Pakistani government and military viewed as a humiliation. So it really brought the relationship to a low ebb. Uh, and it, I was there in Kunar province, which is right next to Pakistan. And I had been uh, coming and going to to that province because it's historically very important uh, province in during the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan. When they pulled back from Kunar within six months, the Mujahideen had come in uh, over there. And, and historically, just its geographic location, and it's a very narrow. Uh, province, very mountainous border with Pakistan, but once you get over that mountainous uh, ridge, you have a wide agricultural valley that leads from Asadabad down to Jalalabad, and Jalalabad is the main uh, city of the east, and from there it's really a straight shot um, west to, to Kabul. So it had historic importance and it was certainly where a um, focal point of interest for the Al-Qaeda-affiliated um, terrorists and the insurgents um, connected with them. Kunar has, if you go up beyond Asadabad, up north of Asadabad, it turns mountainous very quickly. The Hindu Kush massif is just uh, really quite impenetrable. So there was this kind of soft belly of the agricultural valley that the special ops teams moved into. This is where 80% of the population of the province is. And they found a willing population there. Um, the, the structure of the village defense program was to limit the number of volunteers to 300 in each district. So the idea wasn't to build vast militias, but really a local defense force that would be robust enough that it could survive, but not big enough that it would start um, you know, becoming a military power unto itself. The problem was, as this initiative really took on 
uh, esteem. Uh, and I should actually pause for a minute and say, I, I do think that the special ops teams were very talented in the way they worked with the local population. But I came to realize the places where it succeeded really required a charismatic Afghan. It, Afghan leadership was just essential. Um, and in the case of Kunar, there was a fellow named Noor Muhammad. And he was, and there's a picture of him in, in my book. I, there, I have a number of pictures of the Afghans because I try to bring to life their role in this as well. And he's, a, a, he's um, 44 years old, very serious guy, very steady. So he, wasn't, he was charismatic in a quiet way. He gained the trust. He's a local. He was a native there. He became, became a very avid recruiter. Um, he not only helped recruit for his district, but then he helped go to the next districts. Now, they had their own leadership, but he would go and help them. Um, and it wound up with four districts really supporting each other. I called them the Band of Brothers. Uh, so it really didn't matter. They weren't getting a lot of support from the provincial chief of police. They had a lot of problems with the provincial level government, but they were knitting together and providing this real grassroots um, a safety net, security uh, net. The problem was on the border with Pakistan, there's a village called Maya. And Maya was a Taliban base, and it was being used as a way station and a transit point. And the, the first team that was there when I started going to visit said, we, this, something has to be done here because they can come down the valleys, these lateral valleys from uh, the border, and they're into the populated area in no time. So from my first visit there, it was really pointed out as we got to do something about this. But it was right on the border. And of course, as the US-Pakistani relationship became increasingly uh, tense, they had a hard time getting permission to go and do, um, they wanted to do a, a raid into the village uh, to capture weaponry and any Taliban they found. Now they weren't doing this unilaterally, they, they were doing it with the Afghan commandos, which was another big part of the special ops mission in Afghanistan. They've um, uh, built a, a fairly uh, substantial uh, sized uh, Afghan special ops uh, command with subordinate units. Uh, it's generally considered the most proficient unit of the Afghan military now. So they finally got permission to launch a raid into the uh, village of Maya, and they got the air they needed, the aircraft, the, the helicopters, to drop them in. And of course, they go in at night because it protects them. Um, it's, it's much harder to shoot down a helicopter at night. Um, so the Chinooks came in at night, and they came under fire right away. You can hear a Chinook from a couple of miles away. There was no doubt this was Americans coming in. Nobody else has Chinooks out there. Um, and they started taking fire from the Pakistani border posts. And the, this incident, when I read the New York Times today, and they called this a wayward strike. This was the November 2011 uh, incident that had a lot of cascading consequences. Um, and I had been there just two weeks before this occurred. So the Chinooks come in and land. They come in and they have to make multiple landings to get all of the Afghan commandos out uh, on the ground. And the mountains just go straight up from their landing zone. And the village is nested right there at the foot of these very steep mountains. So they're getting shot at and mortars and uh, materials raining down on them. And the um, chief warrant officer, who was the ground force commander, uh, called for a show of force by the F-15 uh, jet that was on station to provide cover uh, in case they needed it. And he, um, his men were under fire and they were being bracketed by mortars. The mortars, you know, they're being walked into their position. And so it was very much a life or death situation for these men on the ground. And he, he did not want to call for an airstrike, though. He thought, if I can just convince them these are Americans down here, they'll stop firing. So the F-15 came roaring through, made a pass, another pass, and then a minute later, they start receiving fire again. So it was quite clear 
that this was an intentional attack on these uh, troops down below. And the commander uh, radioed, and the battalion commander, he's on the satellite phone with him, and they're discussing this as it's going on. The battalion commander is back in Bagram. Um, at the uh, military base there. And as is generally, um, you know, the procedure, he, he backed up the man on the ground and he said, from everything you're telling me, there's no question, but you've got the right to call in the strike, so go for it. So they did. They took out the posts that were firing. There were two positions that were firing on them. And this part is, is public and well documented, but it got very twisted in the telling in our media for reasons that... Um, well, the Pakistani government the next day came right out and said it was an unprovoked attack and that the U.S. had launched a cross-border attack. And it just, you know, it's one of those situations where the first one out telling the story often is the one that's believed. And in this case, um, that was not the case. It was not an unprovoked attack. It was, um, it was a life or death self-defense uh, counter attack. And there was a big investigation. There was a huge um, diplomatic uh, wrangle over this. As it turned out, John Allen, General John Allen, the ISAF four star commander, was in Pakistan at the time, caused a big diplomatic rift. The Pakistani government ended up closing the border uh, to, uh, to U.S. military resupply. Uh, it was just, it, it was the final straw that broke the back of the relationship. Um, and that deep freeze didn't go away for six or eight months until they finally opened up the um, the border. And I, I interviewed the, the uh, ground force commander, and he was very disappointed that he felt that never did the real story get told to the American people. So obviously I felt like I needed to include this um, in the book. And they were able to go ahead and clear the village, and they found massive. It was their largest cache of weaponry that they found in their entire year-long um, uh, deployment, and there were Pakistani army uniforms. There was all there were all kinds of signs of really how much this was uh, the key base for that part of Kunar. So we can talk more about that, but the the main point is that um, these um, the forbearance that these. Uh, small teams showed, and in that circumstance, General Mattis, who was the U.S. Central Command commander at the time, came out at Christmas, uh, spent Christmas with the troops in Afghanistan, and he made a point to find this uh, chief warrant officer, and he said, um, I know you did not have to call for that show of force, and that was a courageous thing to do, and your actions were uh, completely in the right. So that young soldier felt that meant the world to him, that despite all of the bad press that you still see, I mean, look at the New York Times today, they called it a wayward strike. His story still hasn't really been corrected in the media. So I want to back way back now, and these stories, I have many of them in the book. It was really my intent to try to go out there and just watch what was happening and share uh, the day-to-day uh, sometimes it was watching paint dry. You know, you didn't know if these villagers were going to come forward or not. A lot of complexities. Uh, Taliban intimidation, very strong in many places. In some cases, like the South, uh, the economy really revolves around poppy. And the Afghan government was trying to do a massive poppy eradication campaign. And uh, a lot of the special ops teams felt this was a very, really working at cross purposes with them trying to get the villagers, you know, to, uh, to band together and uh, deal with priority number one, which was the security situation and the Taliban. So there were problems every day. There were all kinds of complications in every, every place that I went. So perseverance was really one of the main uh, traits that I began to see as uh, a requisite for eventual success. Did it succeed? Did it work overall? I think the critical parts of the Afghan countryside were secured by this initiative. And in places like Paktika, another critical border province where there really was very little conventional force presence um, and a very critical corridor. Um, and that was largely due to, again, a charismatic Afghan. Turned out to be a Tajik 
in a largely Pashtun province. And I tell that story in uh, another chapter. Uh, and that uh, individual was, um, he didn't come up through the tribal elder vetting process. He actually was known to the special ops teams from their earliest days in Afghanistan after 9-11. But the elders did embrace him, and many tribes of different um, affiliations came to support him. So it was really one of those, I thought, fairly heartening stories that Afghanistan's peoples are not quite as divided as sometimes uh, portrayed. So overall, this initiative grew to 25,000 um, Afghans signing up for this initiative. And it, the deployment of the special ops teams was 52 teams Again, spread out all over uh, the country. And it was Navy uh, SEALs doing it. It was Marine Special Operations. It was Army Green Beret teams. And all of them had their Air Force um, combat controller because, of course, if they were under a mortal attack, they needed that expert for calling in airstrikes and arranging uh, the air ground coordination. So that's really, I guess, the vision of the joint SOF uh, team at the ground level. Does any of this apply anywhere else? I personally do not believe that we will have such a massive deployment of special operations in any one country in the future. I think in that regard, it was a one-off. A one um, with, if you include the coalition special operators, which were substantial, uh, and not just the NATO soft, but new uh, countries, new partners, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Croatia, Estonia, uh, Jordan, United Arab Emirates. I mean, it was a virtual United Nations of special operators over there. And many of them focused on uh, police response forces, high-end as well as provincial. So you really had a lot of people doing partnered uh, training advising, combat advising, which meant they would go out in the field with them on operations. Some of them had more restrictive rules of engagement. But I, I, um, this is the reality of what I see as the special operators wave of the future is working in this partnered format. And it's, it's in stark contrast to the caricature that everyone, and I, perhaps it's unfair to call it a caricature because there are unilateral US special operations but they are increasingly fewer. Um, even in the case of Afghanistan, they are now required on any uh, combat raid to have um, Afghan government approval and Afghans along with them. Uh, in other cases, very little noted, Horn of Africa, um, the uh, special operators are working with Kenyans, Ugandans, Ethiopians. There's a lot of partnering going on that people don't know anything about because I think we're kind of fixated on this Hollywood image of you know, Delta and SEAL Team 6 going in alone at night and doing something that is, you know, in many cases, it's, well, it is an act of war. So in my view, we have to be darn sure that the circumstances are justified when we're going to uh, violate a country's sovereignty and go and take out someone on the ground. In, um, and there are cases where a sovereign government will accept that unilateral application of force. That's the case, for example, in Yemen right now. The president uh, of Yemen has um, uh, publicly uh, endorsed that. But by and large, my view is the most uh, palatable, palatable application of special operations is going to be in a partnered way, whether it's a multilateral um, operation, such as I've described just now, or that country saying, come in, help us build up our own capability. This is what happened in Colombia, in the Philippines. We can talk more about those decade-long efforts and what they've resulted in. And I, I don't mean to dismiss the difficulty of this. Uh, I think if, if we can, when we get into discussion, I'll be happy to outline what I think are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, special ops toolkit. Um, I think it probably is a good point for me to pause now and take any questions, and I'm very much looking forward to any topics. You could also ask me about any other um, aspects of special ops that I haven't raised. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've got some good questions, and I've grouped them in some areas, and I want to sort of 
globally here, there's uh, some questions about the future of special operations versus conventional forces. And I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the questions they have that do direct action versus indirect action. And then places where special operations are being elsewhere, used elsewhere, and then come back to Afghanistan and end with talking about more detail about Afghanistan. The question dealing with the direct versus uh, indirect action, though, let me take that one first. And that's, what is the greatest challenge of the special operations transition from more iron fist initiatives to velvet gloved ones? And what are the implications of this transition on effective foreign military capacity building? Well, I uh, have often referred to the, the May speech that President Obama gave at the National Defense University, which I think was the fullest public articulation of, of a new direction for the counterterrorism policy. Um, it's, it's a kind of high-level statement, but the implications are clear. The use of drones will be more restricted and more limited to what are considered really dire and imminent threats. And if you look at the trend of the reported numbers of drone strikes, they are uh, coming down. Um, I've, I've posited a kind of hierarchy or toolkit of drones, raids, and partnered partnering uh, modalities as, as a simple way of looking at the different uh, ways that uh, special ops can be used. And I think it's a little more graphic than indirect, because indirect is, well, it's the opposite of direct, and it's not that clear what does that really uh, mean. And it can mean using civil affairs, or it can mean uh, just doing information operations, but it can also mean training a partner force and going out there with the permission of that government and getting in a shooting fight. Uh, so it really encompasses such a wide range. You need to sort of articulate, well, what is the problem there? What do the two governments agree is needed? But I think that the, the bottom line is there are and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert, uh, so I kind of, I, I refrain from opining about the legality. The laws of war were in combat, there are certainly justified uses of force in self-defense. Uh, Congress passed after 9-11 the authorization to use military force to go after those that attacked the U.S., Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. Although there is, I think, a very thoughtful debate going on now about at what point does that authorization, uh, you know, outlive its usefulness? We're talking now about second or third generation of Al Qaeda groups that are really not um, directly traceable to the 9/11 events. So I think there's a lot of uh, thoughtfulness about under what circumstances is the direct action approach. Uh, valid and legal outside a theater of war. Uh, and what I have observed, and I use Pakistan as the example, but there's a lot of political and diplomatic fallout uh, complications when you take actions on another country's soil uh, without their permission. So I will pause with that. And we might come back to that. I, I want to talk about the newspapers talk about the reduction in the size of the US military. How do you think the growth of special operations will play out in a restricted, restricted budgetary environment? Does its role as a future weapon of choice give the special operation forces some insulation against cuts? Well, I would say observing over the last 12 years and getting increasingly immersed in the details of special operations and what they do, there is no doubt that they have um, proved themselves to be uh, very versatile and very useful in a variety of modes. Before, you know, pre-9-11, it was hostage rescue. You know, there were sort of limited tasks and, and very discreet rendering safe nuclear weapons. You know, they were thought of as uh, a 911 force you called in to do discrete missions. And today, they're working in a, a number of capacities. They've been out there with conventional forces side by side. So, so I think their utility is very widely recognized. But the size and the budget 
I think you have to look at two things. First of all, sequestration, you know, that's a broad measure. They've taken their haircut along with everyone else. Of course, they're trying to argue and saying, look, we're 33,000, uh, but we've been used so widely. We're deployed everywhere, 77 countries in a given year. You know, please don't cut our budget. But sequestration is the law of the land, and while it is, they'll take their cut with everyone else. What is most important in my mind, and what people I think haven't focused on yet, is the implications of a shrinking military overall. Because most special operations forces are recruited out of the conventional forces, because they want people that are already knowledgeable and experienced in the basic military skills. So then they try out for uh, these elite units. And you, I think you will see a shrinkage proportionate to the cuts of the overall military. Um, I, I know they are loth to accept this, but the alternative is to lower the standards. Uh, and the first rule that you'll hear out of any special operator's mouth is quality is more important than quantity. Uh, so that's really the trade-off, and I think that uh, the, the consequence will be the policymakers and the top military leadership will start to have to decide and prioritize if we have fewer, then where are we not going to send them? Well, let's move to... Uh globally use of special forces and it says what's the greatest success story for special operations forces that we've never heard about <laughs> well of course i've tried to just make the argument that it is this um afghan local police and village stability operations and i would like to give another little pitch for that being really a tremendous not only did they have the effect desired, but the amount of, of care that went into crafting the method that they were going to use. And early on, and many of them were quite frank in admitting, early on after 9-11, they were out there in Afghanistan and they would, I'll use the special ops vernacular, they would round up some indig and go hit some targets, <laughs> indig being indigenous uh, personnel. This was light years away from that pro approach. They were really trying to start with the population, start with that village social structure, recognizing the power that the elders have in that society, and go sit with them and talk to them, figure out what the problems were. Because many times, the reason the Taliban had come in and sunk roots there was because of property disputes, water disputes, uh, mar marginalization of some tribes in Maywand, where I spent a lot of time, the Ishaksai tribe was totally cut out of political power and cut out of the poppy business. So, so they would discover what was going on and they'd find ways to bridge these gaps. Um, and it was social science, it was really working at a very high level. And I will add, I, they, they did not do it alone. They had some intrepid partners. What the heroine of this book is a, a US aid a uh, woman named Mary Ketman. And she actually spent more time in Paktika province than any of the soldiers. She just kept staying, and the teams would rotate out, and she would stay. She, she's um, kind of an Isaac Dennison character. She has a home in Kenya. She's been all over Africa. Uh, the Marines won't let her go now from, from Afghanistan. They keep wanting her to come back to their areas. She just she knows a lot about uh, community building. She knows a lot about development. Uh, and so uh, they found these partners and they would work with them. And I think to me, this is really, um, it's not the you know guys jumping out of helicopters in the dead of night, but it's some pretty amazing stuff. And in my view, um, working, and they did jump out of helicopters in the dead of night, but with Afghans, and that's a lot harder. If you're training up a force uh, that doesn't have half the skills or nutrition or equipment that you have, you have to be ready at every moment to compensate for that. But that's how you get the long-term solution, because after all, it's their country, and they're the ones that you want to be able to leave behind to take care of business there. Yeah, that's great. I thought you might mention Colombia too, because you know something about the special forces, uh, special operations forces in Colombia. Could you comment? I will, and I I do think that Colombia is a success story. I lingered on Afghanistan be, in part because people have such an overwhelmingly negative view 
of the situation there, and I'm actually less pessimistic about Afghanistan's future. We can talk about that more. But let me talk a little bit about Colombia, because I have actually I spent a lot of time in Colombia. I love Colombia. And first, like many reporters, I was focused on the drug war, because that was what the American angle was. And then I realized, well, over half the country is in the grip of this insurgency called the FARC. Um, and they had been in control of much of the countryside for decades. And the Colombians, and it really did take Colombian will uh, to start uh, grappling with the fact that their country was in the grip of an insurgency and they needed to uh, start uh, getting after it. The special operations forces came in and trained a uh, very capable elite Colombian uh, special ops force, but they also provided advisors to the regular Colombian units at all echelons. There was also USAID and a wider government uh, USAID program, um, but it was done at a, at a pretty low uh, level. I think the total over 11 years was $7 billion. Now that may sound like a high price tag to you, but if you think about the sums we've spent in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's a bargain to have now a, not only a stable major Latin American country, but what they call an exporter of security. Because the Colombians are actually now training other Latin American uh, troops. They're helping in West Africa. They even sent people over to Afghanistan. Uh, so they're really uh, growing up to be a partner. And that's a payoff. That's a return on investment that I think is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, thank you. The question here, are special operations undermined by the publicity surrounding such operations? Hard to read. That's that's a, a great question, and obviously, I guess I'm guilty as charged since I'm giving them publicity. Um, but I think that there are... are um, two sides to this story. You know, the American society is more open than ever. You know, it's, it's very hard to keep secrets, as we've been <laughs> reminded in many ways this uh, last year. And I think that openness is here to stay. I think that people uh, want and demand information. And I think that it, it, you can see an acceptance of this in the difference uh, the way in which Admiral Bill McRaven, who's the current four-star commander of the Special Operations Command and, of course, the um, leader of the uh, raid into Pakistan to get bin Laden, Operation Neptune Spear. Um, and he's been very public, and he speaks a lot. He's, he's out all the time. Uh, and he's also in Washington a lot. And his, um, his view is very much that he, he needs to explain what special ops is doing, in part to dispel erroneous views, in part to forge this partnership that he thinks is so vital uh, with other elements of the government. And they, they've not you know, achieved their goal yet. I mean, they're misunderstanding all, mis misunderstandings all the time. Um, they don't always explain themselves well. Many people fear there is some alternative, you know, there's some subterfuge involved. And frankly, there have been some stub toes along the way. After 9-11, some special operators were sent into countries without the permission or knowledge of the U.S. ambassador there. That has now been corrected, and it is absolutely the ambassador approves it or it doesn't happen. And that's absolutely the way it should be, and that's from a presidential order. So, so I think getting rid of that secret squirrel image actually has a benefit uh, for what they're trying to do. But there's the other kind of celebrity coverage, you know, the SEAL team guy who writes his book, and they, they, they tend to get PNG'd from their communities. So there's really still a code of you don't talk about yourself or beat your chest. And I thought um, the past commander, Admiral Eric Olson, really epitomized that kind of quiet guy. I was on... Um, stage with him on the anniversary of the Battle of Mogadishu, 20 years since Black Hawk Down. And he had to really be, a few memories of that painful day had to be pried out of him. He just, he didn't want to talk about himself. He was awarded a silver star for his actions uh, there. Uh, and he's, he's really a very self-effacing um, guy. And I think that's, you know, that's still what they want their image to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, I 
we have in the audience today a, a young staff sergeant who's uh, in civil affairs, and he's got a good question here. He said, could you relate how civil affairs operations were effective or not effective in theater? And he said, the three best things civil affairs did. Wow. Well, first of all, I'm very glad for that uh, question because civil affairs are the most deployed unit in the entire U.S. military, um, and we need more of them. Uh, and they do have one general, but it is, I think, a, a, an, a branch that has to be recognized for their utility across the board. And they play a wide variety of roles. They were very important in the Philippines um, in going down to the Muslim uh, areas in the southern islands and really connecting with people that have been quite marginalized. Um, and, and so they're critical door openers in every case. They've done it in Yemen. They've done it everywhere. They're absolutely vital. Uh, and I think that people, perhaps, they don't think of that as special ops. But if you think about special operations as really small units and trying to get into tough places, able to operate on their own, but above all, connecting with people. Uh, and of course, that is what they do. And they go in and they make area assessments. They're very critical to uh, mapping what is going on in that country, what are the conflict drivers, and really I shouldn't say country, in that local area. So they do very detailed assessments uh, and, and also are trying to figure out who's who in the zoo. So they provide and they come back and provide the broader special ops team uh, with kind of an overview of, of what they think the problem set is. In the, I'll give one quick example. The um, civil affairs were often um, used as district augmentation teams, DATs. These acronyms crop up in the military. And in Maywand, in Kandahar, the district where I spent most time uh, down south, the civil affairs, um, he was a major, had done a survey. He undertook to do a survey of everybody who came into the district center. Everybody there is a farmer. What are you farming? What is your what is your cost fertilizer agriculture? You know, he just he got all this data and he showed because USAID was handing out free wheat seeds. So the price of wheat had gone through the floor and the price of poppy, of course, was very high. And he did uh, what I thought was the most sophisticated study I have seen yet about Incentive, incentives, economic incentives, and why people were going to stay on opium for, well, probably my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, by the way, this civil affairs staff sergeant would be in Afghanistan now if it weren't for the sequester. But uh, He asked the same question, could you talk about PSYOPs? Uh, PSYOPs is, and it, I Psychological should, operations. Psychological operations ha has been its uh, historic um, name, and it was um, part of the force when it was uh, originally formed in um, uh, World War II as part of the OSS. Has a long, long pedigreed history, and there's a great book about its history written by Al Paddock, if any of you really are interested in learning about it. A couple of years ago, because PSYOP has this negative connotation, they changed the name to Military Information Support Operations, or MISO. And I'm sorry, but I think MISO's a soup. <laughs> so, so I still say PSYOP because at least everybody knows what, what we're talking about. And they've been traditionally associated with, again, their kind of tactical mission of leafleting, you know, in the early days of the Iraq War to, you know, spread messages, they will leaflet. Uh, through planes, they'll do radio broadcasts, and in Afghanistan they set up radios in a box. They weren't broadcasting though, they would get a local Afghan, so it was really, I think, the sophistication there has grown. And my my visit to Monterey, I was blown away by the social network analysis and the sophistication of uh, what they're doing. It's really, again, high social science, that people are applying new tools and new methods to really, it's a figuring out what are the drivers in this conflict, who's related to whom, and it's not just enemy networks, it's understanding the friendly networks, the population, and who has the clout so that they can go and try to reach out to those individuals and work through them uh, to um, really, it's conflict resolution. I mean, it's, it may be strange for those of you who think the military's job is to go out and kill people, but they're actually out there to try to find solutions too. Moving 
back to Afghanistan and talking about, you, you gave a good example on the training for the Afghan police and the localization. There's several questions here that deal with that whole issue of arming locals. And one person says, do we see problems with arming the locals for after we leave, will it create nothing but chaos? Well, I guess it depends on, you know, there are a lot of people that have placed a lot of faith in negotiations and that the Taliban can be brought to the negotiating table and the war ended that way. Um, traditionally, in the insurgencies I've looked at, you know, there's a fight and talk. There's kind of a mixture going on. And the people in these areas, um, poor farmers, pretty defenseless, you know, that they were being subjugated and intimidated by a couple of Taliban guys on a motorcycle with an AK-47 slung across his back. And they could ride from village to village and basically terrorize an entire district. So I guess I came to view um, the, the arming of willing villagers as, and some of them, I mean, there was one old man with an Enfield, you know, they, it's not that they were totally unarmed, but basically, you know, we're talking very poor rural farmers. And I think that the, the follow-on, uh, while the initial training was provided by the special operators, the whole job of the last year has been connecting them into that Ministry of Interior supply line. The district, which is like a county, the district chief of police is their boss. Uh, and then above him is the provincial chief of police. So I see it working where those guys are good or where there's a workaround. Like in some places, the district chief of police might not have been that interested or he was corrupt, but the provincial ch uh, police chief um, believed in the local police and would ensure they got what they needed. So, you know, it's Afghanistan. Is it going to work? Are these people, if they don't get paid and don't get bullets and don't get gas, are they going to go ahead and defend their communities anyway? I mean, I think the real test will be, what if it turns into a completely volunteer activity? Do, do, are these people, do they have enough stake in protecting their villages that they will continue to do what they've been uh, taught to do. And there is some very strong leadership in places that I would not be surprised if it lasts uh, even through that kind of scenario. We have one here, and this one, somebody you know. It says, Dear Linda, I wanted to see whether you could touch on a few points, and this one's on the training. How do you train the local military units? Do you want them to become special operations themselves? How do you, what do you choose for armament, weapons, and communications capabilities? How do you bring these to U.S. standards? Um, U.S. standards and, and an infantry, I mean, our military has really formed our conventional military to fight other conventional militaries, and that's really not what Afghanistan's facing. It's facing an insurgency, so, you know, the tactics have to be different. But the local defense force, they were getting very rudimentary training. It was defensive in nature, and anyone that they stopped at their checkpoints, they would build these little uh, HESCO barrier, very crude shelters um, where they would... Uh, stand guard on shifts. They were they were only allowed to detain and turn over to the police. So they had no real powers uh, beyond simply defending their their village. Uh, and I think that is appropriate because again, you're not trying to turn this into an offensive force. And that's why I think many people have misunderstood the local defense initiative and confused it with the militias of the previous years where. Uh, Dostum and some of these guys would have 30,000 men under arms, and it was really a personalistic army. Um, what are we training, though, the uh, Afghan formal security forces in? I do have some concerns that, um, for instance, um, they need to be able to operate in a very local way. Uh, there's a very small air force, but there are few English-speaking pilots, uh, mechanics are in short supply. You know, it needs to be a very low-tech 
army. And I think we we also, though, we, they do have to have some logistics and resupply. They have to have administrative processes. And what we've done, I believe, in both Afghanistan and Iraq was we focused too much on just building infantry units and not what they call that logistic tail. We, we focused on the tooth, not on the tail. So then here we were rushing at the end uh, to try to build these systems. And, of course, there was this big pressure to build 350,000 strong Afghan National Security Force, which I think is crazy. Uh, they can't sustain it, and we're not going to pay for it. And I think if you have locals willing to defend their own villages, because this is by and large a rural insurgency, you can do an effective counterinsurgency at much lower cost. Well, this question, were there financial incentives for the villages to sign up for protection and training? They did get part-time pay, and some of them felt, well, we really should get full-time pay because once we identify ourselves as standing up and fighting the Taliban, you know, we're, we can uh, have a hard time going and getting a job somewhere else because people will be afraid that we're going to attract the Taliban as a target. So, so, but they got then a food stipend, and again, they have many of them are farmers. You know, they are farming their little plots. So, so it was a very modest. Um, amount of, of pay. And I think this is something that, um, in my view, it was adequate, but of course, in their view, it wasn't. Um, I think that the ability to clean and maintain their weapons, and this is something, this just basic training that the special ops guys were giving them, um, you know, they need to do that because their gun is really going to be their, their ultimate guarantee. I'm going to come to our last question, and this one's going to be uh, really two questions. But one is, do you think they're going to work out a relationship that uh, a, a more positive relationship with Pakistan, uh, the president? And could you then follow up with what's going to be the end state in Afghanistan after we leave in 2014? Well, Pakistan, that's been such a complex relationship. And obviously, yesterday's uh, meeting was an attempt to get to some new, um, I think it's got to be a realistic relationship, but I believe above all Pakistan has to decide that the policy of supporting armed proxies in a very expedient manner does not serve its interests. And I think they need to really come to that uh, conclusion. And the group that has been of most uh, contention has been the Haqqani network faction of the Afghan Taliban. And I think that if they trust that the U.S. will be around to help provide some advisory support and make sure things don't go south and that India doesn't take over Afghanistan, you know, they have all of these bugaboos, and I think it just needs to be a reassurance that isn't going to break the bank for the U.S. You know, we still have troops in Kosovo. Does anyone know that? You know, a small number of advisors uh, to help see us through, and I'm very concerned that everyone is so exhausted and has such a negative view that they don't understand that this is now the end game. The end game is now. It's not that costly, but if you don't do uh, the right thing now, you will have wasted all of that money and all of those lives. So on that note, I want to thank Linda Robinson for coming today. Thank you for actually going out and seeing our warriors. Yeah.